afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Camille, and I am pleased to um, present to you why all investors should be impact investors. So before I start, uh, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Camille. I'm the founder of Boom Impact Investing. Boom Impact Investing is a green investing app um, that allows people to invest in clean energy and clean tech from $20. We are launching our app next year. We are also an online community uh, empowering people to learn about impact investing and sustainable finance. So today um, I'm going to talk about um, the market outlook and trends of impact investing and I want to talk to you about what drives alpha in impact and then we'll go through um, the performance evidence. So this, the studies and the data around impact. And then I'm going to propose a framework for angel investors who want to get involved with impact investing. So first of all, let's start with defining impact investing. I know a lot of you will know what it is, but um, let's start from scratch. So impact investing are investments made into companies, organizations and funds with the intention of generating social or environmental impact alongside financial return. And it used to be that impact investing was this fringe market on the side, um, but now it's no longer the case. It is definitely mainstream, and I'm gonna go through some global trends and Australian trends that will prove that. So, but before we start, um, let me revisit that um, quote from the CEO of BlackRock um, from last year. So Larry Fink, who manages seven, um, over seven trillion worth of wealth, uh, said, purpose is not the sole pursuit of profits, but the animating force for achieving them. Profits are in no way inconsistent with purpose. In fact, um, profits and purpose are inextricably linked. So this was not anecdotal. This was a huge market um, signal um, that made impact investing and sustainable finance mainstream. So in terms of global market size, we're talking 715 billion. Again, like I said, it's no longer a fringe market. Um, it's a growing market um, and it has a significant value globally. But what's going on in Australia? So it is also growing really fast. Um, the latest research from the Responsible Investment um, Association in Australia um, uncovered that the value in Australia is 19.9 billion um, in terms of the amount invested in impact investment products um, as at 30, the 31st December of 2019. And today, 97% of those investments um, are towards environmental outcomes, so largely green bonds. But again, I would love to emphasize the growth. Um, it has um, experienced a triple digit growth over the last two years um, with a 250% growth. What's driving this enthusiasm um, is the millennial market. 89% in Australia of millennials are likely to consider investing in ethical companies, funds or superannuation that are ethical. This is definitely worth um, keeping in mind for all investors out there. Now, you might wonder, um, okay, this is all well and good, but um, with COVID-19, aren't people now focusing on financial returns above all else? Because we're starting to enter this crisis and um, people might shift um, expectations. Well, actually, I'm here to um, I mean, I'm here to support the argument that um, <clears throat> COVID-19 is actually accelerating the progress of impact investing. Sir Ronald Cohen, who is a um, thought leader in that space and the chairman of the Global Steering Group on Impact Investing, said that COVID-19 is going to give the movement a very big push. Crisis creates a lot of pressure to make sure money delivers what's expected, what it's expected to deliver. And indeed, um, it did create more impact. So after the COVID-19 crisis started, the R3 coalition was um, created. Um, that's an industry initiative led by the Global Investing um, Impact Network. 
um, to respond, recover and build resilience in the face of COVID. So we've definitely seen some collaboration since COVID-19. The two other drivers that are really giving impact investing momentum are the climate action push. It's coming, I mean, I've um, highlighted a few points here, but it's coming from all places. Um, but there's a few examples, the oil prices have dropped. Morgan Stanley has launched a 110 million climate impact fund. And mo uh, most recently, huge news has come out of China, who has committed to net zero by 2060. Knowing that Australia is one of the knowing that China, sorry, is one of the biggest um, coal consumer in the world and that they obviously um, lead the manufacturing um, sector. This will be um, this will be really pushing for um, climate friendly investments in the future. And finally, again, what's um, really pushing the momentum is the millennials demand. Um, and it's worth also saying that Millennials are poised to receive more than 30 trillion of um, penetrable wealth that they wish to align with their values. So this is really where the market is going. Now, this, um, this hopefully will give you a good overview of where we are at in terms of market globally and in Australia. But today, I'm here to dive into why impact can drive alpha, why impact can drive financial value. Um, and I want to show you today the impact alpha um, theory. So the impact alpha theory, I haven't um, come up with it, unfortunately, um, but a very clever group from the US has. Um, the impact capital managers, a network of market rate investment managers is in North America, collectively representing more than 8 billion in impact focused capital has created this framework that you can see um, on the right side of my screen. And these are essentially clarifying ways in which operating with an impact objective enhances investment management and adds financial value for investors, fund managers and their investees. I'm going to dive into all of these and unpack how it works. So the first pillar of um, Impact Alpha is the power to um, access unique and high quality investment opportunities. Because when you um, pursue impact objectives, um, investors have access to deep sector expertise that enhances their ability to source less competitive deals from untapped markets. And that's really interesting. Now, the alignment around impact, value, and purpose um, can also lead to more constructive outcomes in terms of negotiation, which um, could open up for investors more favorable valuation. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is um, around the concept that impact is creating value across the portfolio. Um, so how does that work? Um, Essentially, we have to understand that impact-led startups bring market insights and network that lead to innovative and more effective businesses. They tend to build authentic brands and attract differentiated sources of talent and capital. And I will go through these a bit later on. First of all, they can access public and philanthropic sources of capital, which early stage um, reduce the cost of their capital. It can also um, enhance their branding and storytelling to be impact driven. Um, and finally, impact is also a way um, for startups to um, enhance their employees and customer retentions. And all of this actually leads to stronger returns of valuation and exit. Now let me dive into each uh, theme a bit deeper because it's not so obvious. So, Let's, let's start with um, the talent and employee retention topic. So impact-driven startups have inspired workforce that are more productive and creative. Um, they create this authenticity, authenticity um, and happiness at work. And we all know that millennials and Gen Z are looking for a sense of belonging um, and having an impact for them is really crucial. And to finish, um, to finish this argument, I will just cite a um, recent research done by the Harvard Business School um, who found that companies exhibiting both purpose and clarity have systematically higher future accounting and stock market performance. Now, 
let's go back to the branding and storytelling point. Um, that might sound trivial, but actually it can really lead to financial performance. Because a strong and authentic mission creates a powerful brand equity, um, allow, allowing small startups to grow fast, win customer loyalty, and break into the toughest industries. And to make my point, um, I'm sharing with you two well-known examples right here in Australia who broke into really tough markets. So the first one is Future Super um, that I'm sure a lot of you know. So Future Super in the super animation industry only founded in 2014, now managing 900 million um, under management. And the other brand that um, everyone knows, thank you, a small Australian social enterprise uh, who broke into extremely competitive market segments like body care, water and baby products, just um, relying on the strength of their customers um, and their branding. A second, um, a third pillar, sorry, of the impact alpha is um, the argument that impact can strengthen business efficiency. So by focusing on social and environmental outcomes throughout the investment process and alongside, of course, financial results, impact investors can bring additional rigor and discipline to operations, stakeholder engagement and risk management. Here are a few points. So first of all, efficiency in operation through impact accountability. So immediately when you um, report on CO2 emissions or on um, the transparency of your supply chain, um, you got to have a look at your operations and make sure that they are really tight. The second point is the fact that impact driven startups must win a license to operate. Um, and finally, optimizing the social, environmental um, and reputational risk management is something that impact-led startups do quite naturally. And so all these together um, lead to operational efficiency and lower risk, which um, as investors we all like. To prove this point, I would love to bring to your attention a case study, um, the case study of Outland denim, um, you might own a pair of their jeans. Um, and this is really to showcase how impact, um, an impact focus can lead to operational excellence. So James Battle, the founder, founded this company as an avenue for the training and employment of women who have experienced sex trafficking. Um, and, and they now employ women at risk um, to craft premium denim. denim. They have created the best in class denim technologies in the world in partnership with universities around the globe that is now using up to 86% less water, 57% less energy and 83% less chemicals um, in their Cambodian wash and fishing facilities versus traditional denim companies. This obviously leads to lots of savings, efficiency, innovation, um, and we can see how this helped um, Outland Denim win um, in such an um, also very competitive industry. And I will finish off this um, pillar with uh, the risk um, argument. So impact can really optimize social, environmental and reputational risk management. Any um, good impact framework will generate data and perspectives that are not part of traditional underwriting and due diligence process, especially um, when we invest in startups at an early, st at, at an early stage. Um, and so I would encourage investors today on the call or even startups to um, look at impact um, management framework to really uncover um, the risk that they are exposed to and to reduce you know, the political environment, the legal issues or the reputational uh, risk that they might be exposed to. Um, and the benefits are many, but just to cite a few, um, through an impact management framework, um, we see an enhancing in product and worker safety, a supply chain, sustainability and transparency. Um, and of course, when you go through any type of certification and reporting, you, um, you are encouraged to better your operations overall. Um, I'm talking about companies that went through the B Corp Corporation, for example. 
Uh, I do recommend the Impact Management Project, which is an excellent collaboration between, um, between a lot of organizations to build consensus around how to measure, uh, assess and report impacts um, on, on, on environmental or social issues. So definitely something that you can look at for your own company or um, portfolio. Now, this, um, this is the theory, right? This is how, um, this is how impact drives um, financial performance, but you might, um, you might still be a bit um, hesitant at, as whether or not we have some proof of it all and some financial proof of it. So I'm really glad um, that I, to say I think we absolutely do uh, and I want to dive into why impact investing strategies can outperform the market. The first example that I want to go through is my favorite, uh, something that we're really passionate about at Boom Impact Investing, um, green investing. Well, green is a very generic term, uh, but here we're talking about clean tech. So Deloitte has done a um, clean Australian clean tech index for quite a while now, um, and on a period of seven years, the index has outperformed the wider market. And when I say wider market, um, it's been tracked against the ASX 200. On the right side of my slide, you can see the June 2020 quarter. Um, the black line is the ASX and the blue line um, is the um, clean tech index. So as you can see, well above um, the ASX um, 200. And on a five year performance, um, the clean tech index boasts a 53.4% gain compared to 14.7% gain for the ASX 200. So clearly we see um, a big, a big um, up performance here when uh, we look at clean tech. Another case um, I want to go through, I would say study rather, is the MSCI um, ESG investing uh, study. So this is a huge study done across 10 years. Um, it started in, tw um, in 27 um, and concluded in 2017. And they've essentially tracked how ESG affects equity valuation, risk and performance. Because they truly, they knew about the correlation um, factor, but they wanted to prove causation. And they did. Companies with a strong ESG, so um, um, environmental, social and governance profile, are more competitive than their peers, generate abnormal returns, higher profitability and dividends. On the right side of my screen, um, you can see um, several exhibits. So the first one is on the historical beta um, from um, high rated ESG companies versus um, the mean. And uh, further to the right, you can see the earnings to price ratios. On both exhibits, you can see that the ESG companies have um, outperformed um, the, the mean. So again, a proof of um, performance here. Now, something I would love to touch um, to touch on today as well is um, diversity. So when we when we think impact, we might think startups who are dealing with environmental or social issues. But I would challenge um, I would challenge and broaden this definition. Uh, if you are an investor, there are other ways you can do um, impact investment. You can also look at the team in itself. It might be a tech startup, but who are the founders? Where are they coming from? And my point today is that diversity is a big um, growth opportunity that cannot be overlooked. A few, a few stats for you today to prove my point. So, um, a Harvard study has looked at VC, uh, VC, um, several VC funds um, and whether or not partners were investing in people who looked like us or people who were more di diverse. And they saw um, a 26% um, difference in success rate of acquisitions and initial public offerings for investments by VC partners with the same ethnic backgrounds compared to people who really try to look at diverse ethnic backgrounds. So um, really, really an incentive here for you to look at people who, are, who aren't from your background. Um, and one last, um, one last figure on uh, female founders. 
So this is this is some some um, a study done by Crunchbase last year. This this was the um, the most recent and um, comprehensive study I could find. Um, they found that twenty percent only um, of funding was allocated to startups with at least one female founder. Um, so we can we can clearly wonder here um, how much of an opportunity is lost. And I would argue that um, it is a significant one. Um, this um, BCG study is really interesting. They looked at um, 350 companies um, and whether um, the investments was more interesting when uh, given to male founders versus female founders. And they found that for every dollar of investment raised, female run startups generated 78 cents in revenue, whereas male run startups generated only 31 uh, cents. So this is just uh, something for you to ponder on. And um, yeah, all my support goes to female founders. Um, oh, um, apologies, I've lost the connection. May I please get the next slide? Ah, wonderful. So um, with that in mind, I hope I have convinced you that using an impact lens um, will help you find growth and, and find wonderful opportunities, but I won't go deeper into the how. So today I want to propose an impact angel framework. Nothing tr truly complicated, but something to look at if you're interested in investing with impact. So obviously when you invest in, um, in an impact startup, all the same criteria apply. Um, traction and market growth and all of these absolutely matter. But today I'm proposing six, um, six criteria that you can add uh, onto your due diligence process and, and your um, processes. The first one is um, have a look at whether the um, company has an embedded impact. And by that I mean impact must be at the core to the business and needs to be measurable. There, there needs to be a measurable plan in place. Um, startups who say, oh, we're going to give 1% of our, uh, our profits to this charity. This is not an impact startup. An impact startup is really um, driven by impact and delivering it inside out um, of their business model. Um, secondly, are they fixing a painful problem or is it just greenwashing or social washing? Um, there needs to be a genuine social or environmental issue um, that is addressed there. Is the solution scalable? Uh, it's not always evident in the impact space, especially when dealing with um, the social space and human behaviour, um, but empowered by technology or really clever processes social and environmental impact can truly really be uh, scalable. So just make sure that their value is clear and that they can scale. Obviously, like any startup, valuation and traction um, needs to be interesting and fair. Um, this can be directly discussed with the founders, obviously. Um, the two last components are internationally intentionality sorry of the team and uh, the size of the market in terms of um, supporting an impact startup I think it's really interesting to look at um, the founders and why they are doing what they are doing um, because successful impact startups founders live and breathe the impact they are creating and that means they can truly genuinely from the heart leverage their story and they sell what they do everywhere they go because they're so passionate about this impact um, and finally large markets so um, are they working on a large market opportunity um, and can they capture it now, I want to challenge this audience today um, as well in terms of their mindset. So for the investors on the, on the um, conference call today, I want to challenge you to develop those three key um, impact investors mindset to truly invest with impact. The first one is patience, um, which, which we're more or less good at, um, I guess. In the impact space, we have to be open to longer time horizons sometimes and um, we have to keep an open mind to non-typical business models. 
Um, for example, if you invest in bio um, energy, this requires a lot of um, upfront capital. It's not your typical um, tech startup hockey stick. Um, it might take a bit longer, it might uh, take a more um, different stakeholders, so um, be open and patient. Be curious is my second um, mindset tip. So impactful startups might look at problems you know very little about and they might serve a market that you know little about as well. So be open, ask lots of questions, founders um, need, need to communicate that very clearly to you. The third one is the most difficult one, fight your bias. Um, we need to be intentional on how we discover founders and seek diversity, um, really being inten intentional with that. And sometimes I would argue that skipping the pitch might be a good idea because we know that female founders and um, people from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds might not do as well in pitching exercises as their male um, counterparts. So we have, to, um, we have to give them a real chance and perhaps meet them where they are, um, where they are without the pitch. Now, how to get involved? Um, hopefully by now you are excited about Impact and you want to get involved. Um, so let me tell you about how um, to become an Impact Investor if you are not already um, and how to expand your network if you are already. So there are lots, um, this slide will be necessarily lacking. There's lots of Impact Investing groups that are excellent in Australia, Giant Leap obviously, Energy Lab and the Cleantech Accelerator has an excellent um, angel group uh, focusing on clean tech startups um, and a recent one is Impact Queensland um, who is launching and building an impact fund um, focusing on purpose-driven startups. The last, um, the last place where we sh you should definitely look at is Impact Focused Accelerators. This is how you're going to meet um, diverse backgrounds, diverse uh, people and uh, really interesting um, impact issues. Just a few remarkable, um, the latest is the Ocean Impact Pitch Fest, looking at ocean solutions. Catalyzer is excellent as well, um, supporting micropreneurs. And SHEO is an excellent network if you are looking to support female founders. And of course, I uh, cannot leave you without encouraging you to join our community. We um, host impact investing and sustainable finance um, webinars every fortnight for free. So please join us. We're close to 500 members already. Uh, the group is growing really fast and I would love to have you on board. So just, just jump on Meetup to, to, um, to join. Um, thank you so much. This is it for me today. I look forward to um, answering your questions if there are any. And um, obviously, do not hesitate to get in touch with us if you want to talk clean tech investing um, and energy investing, which is our specialty at Bloom Impact Investing. Um, and yeah, thank you so much.